Hi everyone, welcome again to Author Story. I'm Alexander Lim, your host. And for this episode, I'm interviewing Adrian Owen, author of the book, Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the border between life and death. And for those of you following along who are interested, you can go over now to the Amazon link in the description below the video and check out or get a copy of his book. So Adrian, welcome to Author Story. Thanks for being our guest. Thanks very much for having me on. Cool. So Adrian, um, to start off, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? <clears throat> yourself? What's your author story? Uh, I am a professor of neuroscience uh, up in Canada uh, in a place called London, Ontario, a Western university. Uh, as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, I'm not from Canada. I, I grew up and I trained uh, in, the, in the UK, uh, both in, in London um, and in, in Cambridge. Uh, that's where I really got into neuroscience and into a particular branch of neuroscience known as cognitive neuroscience, which uh, really involves a lot of uh, the development and the use of uh, brain scanning technology, things like uh, MRI and PET or positron emission tomography. Mm, okay, cool. And of course, this uh, this definitely plays to uh, what we'll be talking about later on this evening. I mean, all the research came about from this kind of technology. I did. Um, I mean, well, the research that I describe in the book really came a came a um, uh, came about as a, through a collision of this technology and my personal life. In fact, um, so early on in my training as a cognitive neuroscientist, um, a former partner of mine ended up in a vegetative state. Uh, she had a, a brain aneurysm, a, a rupturing of an artery in the base of her brain, um, and. And this was a, an interesting situation for me, I mean, difficult and interesting, but um, it, it really uh, pushed me in the direction of trying to apply these techniques that I'd been using and developing to this strange and mysterious situation uh, of understanding what it's like to be uh, trapped somewhere between uh, full wakefulness and awareness where you and I are right now uh, and complete lack of awareness that we'd all assumed was the case in these patients who are in a vegetative state and the story that unfolds in the book re really runs um, through this theme of how we gradually discovered that not all of these patients are what they appear to be uh, and eventually um, as you'll read they, we went on to develop a means for communicating with some of the patients and finding out a little bit of, uh, more about what it must be like to be in this situation. Cool. Okay, interesting, I got that. So before we really get deeper in the subject matter, I have to ask, um, what, who is this book for? I mean, what, in addition to, yeah, who is it, who is it for? I think this is a book for everybody, at least that was my intention when I set out to write it. Um, it's not a science book. Um, I, I've been writing scientific articles and papers for 25 years now. Um, but a lot of what I do and a lot of the experiences that I've had and the decisions that I've made about the science have come from the lives and the stories that the patients have told me. And, you know, I, I, there, there are many patient stories in the book. Uh, there are many, you know, that might sound a bit, a bit depressing. I don't think it's depressing at all because there's, there's lots of amazing stories where the human spirit has triumphed over uh, great adversity. We've had, there are patients in there who've come back from the grey zone, patients who've recovered and lived to tell their tales. Um, so I, what I try to do is to, it's, I think of it a little bit as a scientific adventure story because it's not, a, it's not, it's not science, but it, it's about the process of doing science and how that can impact on people's lives. And I try to tell it through personal anecdotes of my own, things that have happened to me along the way, but also many of the, the, the patient stories, uh, the patients that I've encountered along the way. Mm, okay, okay, got that. So can you, for the benefit of our listeners and for those of us who aren't familiar with this, can you define for us what this gray zone is? So I think of the gray zone as being uh, any situation in which you uh, might find yourself between a state of being completely awake and aware, as you and I are now, and being completely unaware of anything going on around you. So, I mean, a, a, a very good clinical example might be the vegetative state. That's a condition that's often referred to as wakefulness without awareness, because patients in the vegetative state open their eyes 
um, they'll sometimes appear to look around the room. They have these so-called roving eye movements. They'll they'll blink. Um, uh, they'll sometimes cough and splutter. They they go to sleep at night, but they. Importantly, they don't make any responses to any form of external stimulation. You can't get them to look this way or that way or squeeze your hand if you, you ask them. And this is the, the basis upon which it's always been assumed they have no awareness. But there are other conditions that are also what I call grey zone conditions. Many people listening to this will have had a general anaesthetic at some point in their lives. Uh, otherwise healthy people, maybe you, know, maybe you had an appendix removed or something. And general anaesthesia is another condition in which at some stage we're fully awake and aware and then it's all gone where are we we've gone off into this other zone right. and you know there are many cases that have been reported now of so-called anesthetic awareness where uh, people coming back from anesthesia or indeed during the course of surgery report the experience of being aware of certain things happening and obviously it's it's not awareness like yours or mine is right now um it, it's somewhere somewhere in the grey zone and you know these are the sort of various different conditions that I explore in the book the different ways in which we can end up in this situation of being not quite here and not quite there and what I try and shed light on is how we through science can understand these conditions uh, and try and um, you know even uh, interact with people who are, are, are in some of these situations. Okay interesting got that. So Adrian throughout the course of your research um, I'm not sure. How, how can you, how would you be able to describe what it is like for someone to be in the gray zone? Well, I think that's a great question. It's one that we're still really uh, exploring. I can tell you what it's like for some specific people to be in the, the, the gray zone. Uh, in the story, I, sorry, in the book, I tell the story of a patient from here in Canada, in London, Ontario, who had been um, following a road traffic accident, had been uh, in uh, a state that was repeatedly diagnosed as being vegetative for 14 years. Um, when we when we scanned him the first time, it was completely evident that uh, this wasn't the case. In fact, that he was uh, very much um, conscious and aware and had been for the, the whole 14 year period. He'd witnessed every conversation going on around him, every decision being made on his behalf. Um, and it was, he was one of the, the cases that we we further developed our technique to even to, to even manage to communicate with him to to find out what it was like and actually he, he told us many things um, uh, that had happened since he'd been uh, since he had, he'd had his accident things that had occurred in the period between in the fourteen years between his accident and the day we scanned him um, we were even able to ask him things like are you in any pain because. Um, you know, that seemed to be a, a terribly important question to ask a person like that. Um, you know, are you in emotional pain? Are you in physical pain? Um, you know, are you depressed? You know, how hard is the situation? And um, some of these questions we've managed to, to ask patients who are, are trapped in the grey zone. Okay, and uh, what, what has come up from all this? I mean, uh, are, are, are they in pain? Do they experience pain? Do they experience emotions? Or is it just like, you know, they're, they're an obviously observer kind of like floating in a cloud something like that? No, quite quite the contrary, actually. I mean, there, there are sort of two answers to, to your question. One is that um, these patients that we've discovered, and I, I should emphasize, this is not this is not every vegetative patient. It's about one in one in five or 20 percent of patients who appear to be vegetative actually turn out to not be and to have some degree of residual awareness and, and perhaps some ability to communicate. Um, and by and large, when we um, question the, these patients what they report is very much the same thing that you or i would likely report if we were in a bed and completely immobile right. uh, and just witnessing the world go by they don't see themselves as being outside their bodies or uh, floating above themselves or anything sort of strange and, and metaphysical like that they they just see themselves as being trapped inside an immobile body um, and that's very interesting the, the second piece of evidence, the second way of answering your question is referred to a study that came out last year of patients who are in the so-called locked-in syndrome. And they're, they're not completely like the patients that I'm describing, but they're, they're similar in a way. They can typically only move their eyes to communicate, but otherwise they're entirely uh, cognitively fine, consciously aware. Those patients, and this was a study of a very large number of patients, and I think this will surprise a lot of people, mostly 
those patients reported finding some satisfaction in their lives. They didn't report that they were depressed. They didn't report that they wanted to die. In fact, most of them said that they didn't want to die. And this is was a big surprise for me, and I know it was for this this community. That um, you know, I, I, I'm not convinced that these conditions are necessarily a, a fate worse than death, which is an expression that many many people use when thinking about it. And I think we really need to evaluate. Um, what we know about these conditions in order to to uh, to, you know, to really understand them and, and make the sorts of decisions that we often have to make about for example the withdrawal of nutrition and hydration or the end of life decision making um we need to bear these things in mind when we're making those decisions right okay. I mean, for, for me that that sounds like a little creepy because i mean, I'm, I'm trying to imagine myself stuck in a bed unable to move for 14 years and know everything that goes on it's uh it's a little I know. Strange for me. No, I know. It's a, it's, a, it's a situation that's very disturbing for a lot of people. And I'm imagining people listening to this might be quite disturbed by it. But what I'll tell you is that this is where the science comes in. And I think this is what makes it so interesting uh, in that, you know, we are now in a position where we can start to investigate and understand some of these situations. And it may well be that it's not quite as creepy or as, as scary as, as we think it is. And you know, I, I tell several stories in the book of patients who have gone on to recover and, and they are not all um, you know, really tragic, terrible stories. These people report things that have happened that they enjoyed, uh, parts of uh, that, you know, the situation that they, um, they, they, they derive some satisfaction from, uh, you know, as well as difficulties that they encountered and problems that they had, uh, you know, in that situation. But, um, you know, I, I think it's fascinating stuff because there's so much that we, there's so much here that we really didn't know only a decade ago. Yeah, yeah, I got that. So how do you, how do you communicate uh, with those who are the great zone? So most of the time um, we use a technique known as functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI and what I'll do is I'll put a, a patient for example into the scanner and you know ideally I would just say to them squeeze my left hand for a yes and squeeze my right hand for a no but these patients can't physically respond you know, that's that's central to their their problems so um, what we get them to do is to respond with their brains uh, I wish I could tell you that the technology was at the stage where I could say to somebody, you know, think yes, and I'll I'll scan you, and I'll know you're thinking yes. And we're not we're not quite that stage yet, but we are at the stage where I can say, um, think about waving your arms in the air as if you were say playing a game of tennis. And when somebody does that, a part of the brain activates. It's a part of the brain that's involved in setting up sequences of arm movements. And that we can use as a as a signal. We can say to somebody, well, um, you know, if you're in there, if you can hear me, uh, imagine playing tennis. And if this part of the brain suddenly lights up at exactly that point, you know, we know they've responded. It's the same way as if I said to somebody, squeeze my hand now, and they squeezed it, mm. we would were in there and they, they were responsive. And obviously, you know, there's lots of checks and balances. We we replicate this. We do it many times. We make absolutely sure we we are. Um, you know, we're making the right decision because the stakes are very high. But once you've made contact there, we can then start to communicate. And a simple example will be to say, well, I'm going to ask you a question. And if the answer is yes, imagine playing tennis now. Uh, and it's been very effective. It sounds it sounds a bit clumsy, um, but it, it works surprisingly well. And, you know, many, many aspects of uh, one situation can be answered with simple yes and no responses. And obviously we drill down, uh, a bit, it's a bit like the old parlor game, we call it 20 questions. Uh, you know, we go through that whole process of asking more and more probing questions uh, that can be answered with simple yeses and uh, knows by changing patterns of brain activity and we using this technique uh, we've managed to learn a lot about these patients. Interesting. Now th this, this realization that people are conscious of the grade to, I mean this brings up a lot of ethical I mean, yeah, ethical questions like you just mentioned like like when to stop feeding them and stuff like that. Um, what are what are some other ethical dilemmas that are coming out with this new knowledge? Well, I think that, you know, that's one of the main ones. Um, I think trying, I think, 
um, I mean, just a general understanding. I think it's, it's actually broader than the picture you just painted there. I think just generally understanding that in many of these situations, people are not what they appear to be, and they may have more awareness than we currently thought. And, you know, I, I expand this in the book to th talk about other situations like Alzheimer's disease, for example. And I think uh, most of us who, who have known somebody who is... Um, who, who has experienced Alzheimer's disease, they will know that um, at the end of that degenerative condition, the person is in a kind of gray zone. They're not, they're not the person they used to be at all. Their personality changes, their memories change, their attitudes change, the whole way in which they interact with the outside world. And I, you know, I think we have a responsibility to try and understand exactly what that's like, because to, to, to date, all we've gone on is the behavior of these patients. That's how we decide what we think we know about them. Well, now we can access their brains, and I think we can use that information to try and understand a little bit more about what these patients are actually thinking, what their opinions actually are, uh, and what they, what they can actually do. And in the specific, going back to the specific example of the, the vegetative state, I mean, 20 years ago when I started on this road, no one would believe, myself included, that we were ever going to actually make contact with a patient and communicate with them. 20 years on, we're now in a position where this technology could be used to ask a patient if they wanted to live or die. Now, that comes with it, as you as you said, it comes with enormous you know, ethical questions, uh, and, but we can tackle them now because the technology is here, the possibilities here, and I think we have a duty to, to tackle those. And, and uh, my colleagues and I spent a lot of time working on this area in particular, which is, you know, well, what are we going to do now? How are we going to use this? What is the appropriate way to use it? Um, and, you know, yeah, sure, um, science and, the, and technology does present new and pressing ethical and, and, and legal questions, but um, you know, they're all addressable. Uh, history has always been like that. Um, and, you know, we'll find a way through and philosophers and ethicists will help us do it. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that, but that's really where we are now. That's the absolute cutting edge of, of, of where we are now. Yeah, and I, I would like to point out, I mean, this is not an insignificant kind of uh, question because there are literally like people, millions of people who are like Alzheimer's, uh, stroke, that sort of thing. And those are a lot of people too. Think yeah, uh, and again, this is this is a theme I re return to in the book. That there, and this is why I, I came up with this term "gray zone" because you know there are many different conditions that um, have nothing in common in how the person got into that situation. I mean, one day I'll see a patient who has been in a road traffic accident and has sustained a so-called traumatic brain injury and ended up in a vegetative state. You know, the next day I'll encounter somebody who you know it's got stuck under a swimming pool and has loss of oxygen to the brain or, or uh, under an avalanche. We had a case recently of a person who'd been uh, under snow for, for many minutes and had lost oxygen to their brain. And you know that the type of brain damage um, that these patients sustain is very different, but they all end up in this gray zone, in this situation where we don't know based on their behavior whether they are here or not. Um, you know, it's the same again, you, you, know, you mentioned Alzheimer's disease is another example. And, and general anesthesia, I would argue, is a situation where um, we only know what we think we know, which is that based on the behavior, this person is not aware and has no knowledge of where they are and who they are and the situation that they're in, but maybe they do. Right, right, definitely. So Adrian, let me posit this question to you. Let's say you met with someone who was a loved one who would be in the gray zone, and you had only enough time to tell that person one thing, either about the nature of the gray zone or perhaps about their loved one in that space. What would be that one thing you would tell that person and why? The first thing I would tell somebody is that we know you're there. Okay. And the reason for that is that um, in the second chapter of Into the Grey Zone, I talk about the first patient we ever scanned. Uh, and the whole chapter is about her. And, you know, this was at a time when, as I said previously, no, nobody in the world thought this was a sensible thing to do, to put a vegetative state patient into a brain scanner, because everybody said it's a waste of money, a waste of time, you'll find nothing. And her brain lit up, and in many ways it lit the way for the next 20 years of research. And at the end of the chapter, I, I revisit her. Her name's Kate, and she's in the UK. And I, I, go, I went back to see her last year when I was writing the book. And I... Uh, we had a long discussion about, you know, what it was like to be in that situation and to come out of that situation. And her, her most, um, you know, the, the, the comments that 
that really stuck with me were those that, that related to the frustration of people around you not knowing that you were there. She has this amazing way of speaking. At one point uh, in the book, she says, you know, the day you scanned me, I went from being a body to a person again. And her, her experience is that, you know, this is what personhood really is. When somebody knows that you are conscious, that you have some awareness, that's the point that you become a person. You become something that they have feelings about, something that they respond to and they interact with. And for her, a pivotal moment was when, um, when we made her aware that we knew that she was there, she was a person. And that will be the first thing, and indeed it is the first thing, that I tell any patient that I see, that we discover, I say, you know, we know you can hear us. We know, we know that you understand the situation you're in. You know that we know it. Okay, interesting. Got that. Cool. So, Adrian, this is a very interesting topic. Um, do you have, do you know, of any place where we might get any additional ma material, maybe like on the internet, uh, on this topic? Yeah. This. Um, I mean, I realize this book covers a lot of ground and um, I know it, you know, it touches on many uh, issues that people are, are, are going to want to know more information about. So we have a website, intothegreyzone.com. On that website is not only information about the book itself, uh, you know, some excerpts and things, but also some videos. Um, and these are mostly taken from documentaries that have been made about my research over the last 20 years. And uh, they show stories of, of patients, they explain in a little bit more detail how the science works, how the technology works. Some of them are a little even more um, forward thinking than that and, and look towards the future and what might be possible 5, 10, 15 years from now. But I would urge people to go to intothegreyzone.com for more information uh, and to watch some, you know, some videos of, uh, about what it is that we can do and how amazing some of this technology is. Cool. All right. Cool. So thank you for that information for our listeners. Uh, go ahead and check out that website. By the way, that's in the gray zone. That's both G-R-A-Y and G-R-E-Y, correct? That's correct. Yes. The book, the bit, the book that's also titled Into the Gray Zone will be coming out with two different spellings in Europe and in North America. But you can go to either website and you'll, you'll get the same information. All right. Cool. Fantastic. So, in closing then, the book is Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the border between life and death. The authors are guest, Adrian Owen, and you can find this book on Amazon and also Into the Gray Zone, uh, both variations of the website spelling. So, Adrian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for being an author's story. You know, I wish we could talk more. It's a very fascinating topic, and it is definitely insightful. Thanks very much for having me on, Alex. Cool, fantastic. So if any of you listeners want to know more about this topic, please feel free to go ahead and check out Into the Gray Zone, which you can do right now by going to the Amazon link in the description below the video. And if you'd like to follow our author interviews on YouTube, I invite you to subscribe to our channel. So bye for now, everyone. I'll be back next time on Author Story with another inspiring author.